you are still in the United States, if I'm not mistaken, I was a representative of the Philippine um, uh, University, Polytechnic University of the Philippines is also uh, represented here. And uh, around 200 people have signed up to join the conversation on Zoom. So I would want to think that the, the, those who participated in Zoom will not just be coming with an audience but maybe alongside you. But I'm talking too much already. I think it's time for uh, first the invited guests to, to, to talk about uh, our topic today, uh, which is engaging the present, transforming uh, the eminent conversation on current and future social and cultural foods. I would just wish to briefly uh, introduce each one. I'll introduce all at once, if, if, if that's OK. Uh, and then we go on to the conversation. Um, to, my, to my left, um, this is not in accordance with the uh, but it's not because it's here. Uh, this was just handed to me by by um, I would like to introduce Dr. Enrique Lubistri, the media literature called Emilio. He's an associate professor of the, of my department, the sociology and anthropology department at Ateneo, and is currently the director of the Institute of Philippine Culture. Uh, he finished his doctorate in sociology at the National University in Singapore. His master's in social development at the Ateneo de Manila University here, and his bachelor's degree in interdisciplinary studies in the University of well. His research interests over sociology of education, political sociology, and global citizenship education. Um, let me also introduce uh, another speaker or convers conversant, uh, Dr. Mary Janet Arnado. Uh, Dr. Arnado is the Chair of the Behavioral Sciences Department of the uh, De La Salle uh, University uh, College of Liberal Arts, and uh, and a faculty research fellow of one of the institutes in Qatar. She obtained her PhD in sociology from Virginia Poly Polytechnic Institute and State University, and her MA in Health Social Sciences from the De La Salle University. In 2010, she was named Outstanding Young by the Department of Science and Technology in the Philippines. And uh, she has been the recipient of the Republica Regional Award in Social Science given by the Commission of Higher Education of the Philippine government. Uh, her areas of specialization are in globalization, uh, gender, gender migration, natural resources, violent conflict and internal displacement, colonialism and uh, Filipina feminism, sustainable uh, agriculture uh, in uh, the, the region of Southern Asia and Europe. Uh, our uh, third uh, conversant is Dr. Ismael Al um, He is a professor at the, sorry, I pronounced it right. Uh, really can stand. <laughs> yeah, I tried to really study French, but that's a tough back. We know, we know, we know the management. Uh, and uh, remains a senior member of the Wilson College in Cambridge. Uh, he previously held academic appointments through the business school in the UK, at the, but also at the ECO Polytechnic Federal de La Fan in Switzerland, uh, the University of Reading in the UK, and the University of Cambridge. Uh, his research focuses on the sociology of organization and the nature and authority on legitimacy. Uh, recent projects interrogate the evolution of normativity in morphogenic societies. That is, societies where change tends to be encouraged. Uh, thanks to Chat GPT for this. I must have heard. Yeah. 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 technology. Uh, for all of you, Chat GPT and Google. Sorry for that. Uh, Dr. Dr. Catherine Hirsting, this thing is called the one word. Uh, Dr. Hirsting is a research fellow at the Macquarie University, still on. Uh, their interdisciplinary research contemplates understanding issues of social justice and inequality alongside developing and evaluating policy and program responses for social change. Um, her or their written focus uh, includes legal need for clients of their legal assistance. Uh, the causes of homelessness, economy, and older women, and international student financial. Um, 
recently. Okay, Karate. Uh, and um, last but not least, no, no, I still have two, sorry. Uh, let me also introduce Dr. Grant Pompil. Sorry, Dr. Grant Pompil is a national lecturer at the University of South Australia. Uh, he has been a teacher and university researcher in Australian secondary schools and universities for 40 years. And that was your help, David Chapman. Uh, uh, his recent publications include Journeys to Critical Realism, uh, Exploring Spirituality, Love, and Human Manifestation, uh, Business as Usual, Examining Critical Management Studies, and Environmental Sustainability Education, and The uh, Impossibility of Intellectual Workers when the neo, within the neoliberal uh, university. Uh, notably, he is also the author of Critical Realism for Marxist Sociology and Education. Uh, published by Routledge in 2016. Last but not least, uh, is uh, Douglas Porpora. Uh, he's the president of the International Association of Critical Realism and professor of sociology in the Department of Communication at Russell University. My, our staff says that you're so difficult to find the internet. <laughs> you're difficult to find online the, the, the profile. So, robots. They don't, they don't do anything better. <laughs> okay, you can, you can probably begin the conversation. Um, I agree with some of you that um, we can, uh, if you have some thoughts about the topic, engaging the book and transforming the element uh, about current and the future of the uh, Five to ten minutes maximum, okay? Then we'll have a real conversation. Um, anyone who would want to begin? Uh, So, uh, Dr. Almodias, uh, starting the conversation. So, if I get that the next one, so hello everyone. Um, I'd like to share with you a few thoughts. Uh, that could be uh, probably a desirable or a future for a future for sociology, knowing that without a critical reality, okay, the future is fundamentally open. The future will also greatly depend on what we make them. However, I would like to extrapolate a little bit on the basis of personal tendency, which I find, which I believe to be unique, and which I also believe to be desirable in terms of future, possible future technology. I would like to talk about the future of hybridization. So those of you who will be familiar with uh, the Baba, for example, uh, will be familiar with it. Now, I would like to suggest that we could perhaps maybe very crucially be hybridized along two dimensions. The first dimension I will mention is an interdisciplinary dimension. They want to Say how it has already started, that perhaps more than we see, uh, more than we And secondly, the second form of hybridization, I have to wonder if it's most, if it's frequent. It is the hybridization between no, and especially with a special emphasis on the fact that no sociologists should also expect and welcome hybridization from self and years. You know, if we want to break with the corona, then we should start thinking in terms of we start with the no bringing knowledge. We could start with thinking or with the, with the imaginary that's a twisted imaginary that the best the South can do is apply faithfully process that come from the more, or maybe at the maximum find specific concepts that will depend on the specific. It means that southern sociology of the global south and human civilization will also mean that sociology from the northern east is like a Going back to the first dimension, sociology and interdisciplinary. It's not surprising that they had a position to be obligated between sociology and sociology. I mean, actually, apart from the North American department, 
is perhaps the most difficult one to talk about. If anything, because it, to talk about long-term and sovereign relations in, in a short term, also means that we have to talk about episodes that hurt. It also means that we have to talk about um, injuries that sometimes still leave. Yeah. And so here's the point in particular of what happens when someone like myself, who is mixed race, has been living in the north and living in the north, but I'm based in a northern university. And I must be the right answer to the Now, back to that example of the, uh, of the cleaners, of the workers. Um, we had referees who would keep cutting in the number of referees who are using. Why? Just because in the journal of classic modern work, and this is where there is a dynamic and very perverse because they tell you that it will be something by two Indian authors and two European authors. They are to be used. But then you know that the readers are becoming familiar with the two northern authors. And quite well, you can expect an important to be quite familiar with the southern authors. So we need basically the movement of In business, what is that happened? There are movements about decolonizing the history. There have been quotes, for example, in the Journal of Foundation. In organization, there are quotes to decolonize. My friend and colleague said, We are people who do it well. That's the problem. It's not as global as it should be. So, what is the kind of broadening? It must be not. It is true that you wouldn't need that problem. Um, by working with Indian folk, Started to discover them hidden things. But also that is important to you to you lots of social theory better than that. But see how today we're talking here about the system with the single burdens that in this one what I'm here for. But they will talk about the further rather than pretend it doesn't exist. My friend. So, how do we push the basic important is our social movement? We need to have a like sociology, we need to have a like local and social sociology. And probably the North has to make more efforts. Northern sociologists need to allow room, they need also to allow room for criticism, room within journals. Uh, but also they need to have among editors of journals. You are talking about editors of journals because they are gatekeepers. Because in the, I think in the global norm, if you want an academic job at university, you need to prove that you are capable of publishing in the journal. Yeah, so this means that there is an effort to, to be done on that in terms of creating more room. And uh, so, yeah, so hybridity from these two dimensions, which are disciplinary, but also north and south, we have to make to learn uh, from one another. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Professor Amodi, uh, for, for, provoke, for very provoking up in thinking about social movement, creating social movement on hybridity. Um, may we ask if we want to come next? Anyone? Uh, yes, thank you. I just uh, want the microphone. Well, then Professor H.K. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when I was thinking about this topic, I thought what I would do is just really report on some of the conversations I've been involved with in Australia. Um, we've recently had our, well, we recently had the um, International Sociological Association World Congress in Melbourne, Australia. We obviously have our own annual conference as well. And I'm also involved in a thematic group as part of the Australian Association wow. of Sociology. Um, which is looking at applied sociology. And by that, we mean we have members 
We have some members who are in the academy who are employed by universities, but who are doing work where they want the knowledge they create to have impact, to have a direct implementation into whatever their field of interest is. Um, but we also have members who are sociologically trained, self-identify as sociologists, but who are working in government, who are working in hospitals, who are working in social enterprises, who are in not-for-profits, all of those sorts of things. And we meet to talk quite regularly. Across all of those forums, some of the questions have been, what is a sociologist? Like, actually, what is sociology compared to some of the other disciplines? How do we define ourselves? When we work, when we train sociologists within the university and they go out to work, they become invisible. Whereas when we train accountants, when we train um, economists, they will work potentially in, and I'm not saying this, I mean, you know, they will work in an organisation and they'll be labelled as such because they're recognised to be bringing with them and through their education a particular worldview, a particular set of skills, a particular way of approaching problem solving, a particular way of adding value to whatever it is that that business, that government, that um, not-for-profit organisation is doing. So one of the questions we've been asking is about identity, sociological identity. And we think that this has something to do maybe with the observable reduction in students joining undergraduate sociology programs compared to other things. There's been an increase in people doing criminology. There's been um, kind of a, a whole pattern for anthropology, but there's been a, a, a certainly a shift away from people uh, trying sociology on in first year to see how it goes. I think this is partly about how the universities are now structured and the ways that our degree programs are structured. There's not so much flexibility to test out a range of options in first year and then, you know, move into a major later in degree. And some things are a little bit more, um, need to sort of sign up ahead of time a little bit major perhaps compared to before. But that it's hard to tell people what you get out of studying sociology if you find it very hard to describe what it is that sociologists do and if they're not visible in various workplaces of all different types. That was the first thing. Um, the second thing is another group within the Australian Association is social theory. So these are people who are interested in talking about and discussing, discussing sociological theory. And they had a conference last year that was called with a social theory, like where is social theory going? And it was a lot of very similar questions. And one of the things that we discussed there was the connection between sociological identity and the sociological theoretical tradition and how that may be, like, not adherence to, but exposure to those theories trains a particular way of thinking about the social world that we see that makes someone more of a sociologist than maybe someone who hasn't been exposed to those theories. Having said that, I don't know if there's a university left in Australia that actually teaches social theory as part of sociology. And I did a course seven years ago at Sydney University. It was the last one I could find that had an well, it was only one semester, it was half a year, and I paid to do that as an external student so that I could have some kind of structured learning of sociological theory because there wasn't anything else. And I had a conversation with people in the sociology department at my current university who said, oh, they picked that up, the students pick that up through the other courses because if they're doing a course that's, you know, got a really, I hope this is not an inappropriate word, but a really kind of sexy title all about, you know, 
whatever, but taught in a sociology unit, that they will pick up sociological theory through that. And I actually don't believe they do. And so I, I think there's a, um, going to be like increasingly generations of sociology, sociology teachers in undergraduate sociology majors who themselves don't have a strong grounding in sociological theory. And my question is, what does that mean for sociology? And then my third and final point also actually is very reflective um, of what I've already been talking about. Is in my department, I'm guessing there's maybe 12 people with ongoing, like permanent ish in the context of what is permanent anymore, but ongoing appointments to be academics in sociology. And four of them are sociologists by training. We have a number of political economists, we have several anthropologists. Um, and we have someone who is actually at the well education faculty, um, but has a, a job in sociology. So there's already a blending. I think there's two interesting questions here or ideas here. There's already a blending in our department of sociologists with other disciplines, and that has to be impacting the teaching and therefore the way that students absorb what is sociology because of all of the influences that are coming from these other areas of knowledge. But the second and final thing I'd say is that, oh, I forgot where I was going with this, it's really important, but if I can't remember, it can't be that exciting. Um, yeah, that's, it's really, I think, there's something about the interdisciplinarity or the merging that is already happening. And is that a problem or not? And how do we, you know, I know a lot of people in my department who say they are social scientists rather than claiming an identity as a sociologist or within some other disciplinary area. So more observations than answers than you think, but I think there's kind of fundamental questions maybe get to where some of the change is happening and where some of the potential threats are and also where we want to imagine the future of the kind of work we like doing that make us think we're sociologists. Yeah, Catherine O'Brien from the Sovereign News on the invisibility of sociology across the board fields and the Sovereign News again uh, so on um, the classroom. Of sociological theory. But, but let's hear from, um, yeah, from, from others. From a master point of view, um, sorry, I'm randomly speaking, sorry, <laughs> but, uh, you have to understand that I think that's the first one. If we're going to understand where we are now and where the future might be, we have to have a full, true graph of our history. I'm well aware that uh, sitting in this university, this university is a proud place in the development of the in the Philippines. What I'd like to do just very briefly is give my account of the history of sociology in Australia. I think I can identify a whole phase. I reckon they're pretty similar to what you would recognize as the history of sociology in the Philippines. I think maybe just maybe there's a lesson. Uh, <clears throat> yes, we're both from the Southeast Asian, uh, Asian region, um, and sociology emerged at a particular point in history, post World War II. Yeah. So let me begin there. What's in fact with the birth of sociology in Australia? Post World War II, social reconstruction, modernization. It was a project by the state for the capitalist class. That's how it started. It was a project which did not include the indigenous people of Australia. It was white. And it imported ideas from other places, particularly the US. And I imagine that your sociology was particularly influenced by US 
uh, for sure. And with them, they draw a particular positive view of the world. The same with the case in Australia. Now, I, that wasn't necessarily a bad thing at one level for Australian sociology. Because the sociology was geared towards the first case, towards, in some way, in a positive way, with Arthur and survey to tell the truth, or a certain truth about Australian history and about Australian society. But what was absent, as I said, women, ethnic differences, and to some degree social class, but not entirely. With that came a, a, a post positivist impulse that moved us into the second phase, which I call the new way, which is essentially kind of 1975 to about 1990. And this was associated with what, what had been known as the new left. It was a cultural mark of life, of a cultural left, but in, certainly cultural marks. And we borrowed a lot from Britain in that stage, from the cultural marks of, in sociology. Uh, we imported them. So we had more issues related to social identity, culture, culture class, and qualitative methods. There was an over, not an overthrowing, but an uncomfortable between different approaches to sociology. Um, so I would call the new that that new way was quite an exciting period. There was a third way which talked about that much in Australia, but I sensed it. And it came from the US, from Michael Burrow, from the uh, University of California, Berkeley, yeah, who, who came to be in a um, social, uh, as president of the Australian Association, proclaimed that sociology of the it ought not be locked away in classrooms. It ought to engage public. And we had a number of sociologists in Australia, textbooks written, and sociologists uh, informed and trained in, in public social. I saw that as a, a rather exciting development, but it was soon to wither on the vine because by this time, neoliberalism was beginning to bite. Australian University. And sociology was seen, and I can still remember one of our prime ministers saying it was the stalking force of social. So it had to be eradicated from any public discourse because it was dangerous. So that led us into, I think, this phase that we're in now, which Catherine was talking about. Because I do think the neoliberal project has been very, very successful as a political project of the ruling class against the working class. Very successful indeed in taking many things out of universities, like a liberal education, and making it more vocation, more for the economy rather than the citizens, and heaven forbid any social transformation. It's been very successful at that level. Sad to say, that is the place that we're in in Australia at the moment. Maybe just maybe there are some similarities with uh, sociology in the Philippines. Maybe that's the opening up point for future conversation about what sociology can do in this region. Again. Thank you, uh, Grant. Uh, Grant Van Til, let's open up the that uh, that put the that put us to, to the, the history of sociology and also the, the the dark clouds that's gathering around with uh, the, the success of the liberal uh, political and capital uh, then within the university setting. Uh, maybe here um, um 
for Hello? Yeah. yeah. So I am from the Empire, <laughs> the United States. Um, I am a sociologist, uh, although I seem more like a philosopher. Uh, I'm in the Department of Communication at the moment. Um, I had been in the Department of Ecology where they killed it. Oh, I'm sorry. But um, um, yeah, I, 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 I am hybridity incarnate. I, I teach religion courses, social theory to communication, graduate students in communication. Uh, I do political communication. Mostly, I write about how American assess moral things like war and uh, uh, yeah. fascism. Um, I, I come up like my comrade here, um, probably part of the new left. Um, so, um, what can I tell you about American sociology? So, I wrote a critique of American sociology. Um, in 2015, arguing that it was very empiricist, that it had no interest in, that American sociology has very little interest in, in uh, conceptual thinking. It's mostly data collect. Uh, they're conceptually sloppy. Uh, they can go for years uh, studying and collecting data and things that they are nonsensical because they haven't really figured out well, what is action because they, um, they don't think very deeply about this session. Uh, they didn't think very deeply about me either. So, <laughs> uh, anyone who, uh, so the critical realists that I'm a part of, I'm a president, um, um, we talk about ontology, the need for social science and to actually consider like, well, what are human beings? Do they actually behave in deterministic ways according to laws that sociologists um, want to uncover? Um, there's been um, a tendency, uh, a str very strong tendency, not only in sociology and empiricists, but a very strong tendency to elevate methods. <laughs> and Catherine, I'm sorry to hear, I mean, what when Catherine said about and, and, uh, about uh, the disappearance of social theory in um, Australia, yes, it's kind of mirrored in the United States too. That there's uh, multiple methods courses, physics courses. I, I had a student who is now a professor at um, um, UCLA, UCLA, very prominent position, and he told me he got his degree. He was my undergraduate student. He told me. When he got to Penn State, which is one of the larger, more prominent graduate programs, you know, they told me the opposite of what I had taught. So he said, Well, you had taught me that you begin with theory. And then you ask what method is appropriate to answer your questions, and that's what you use. No, you read. I forget what it is. So the journal of sociological methodology. You find out what's the hottest new method. Then you find a data set that can fit that. And then you come up with some theory that explains what you found. Well, this is a kind of a game. Um, and so, and it's uh, exacerbated by the commodification of education. And so universities become uh, corporatized and becoming, you know, I've been in academia for 40 years. Um, I'm glad for myself to come at the end <laughs> because um, more and more research is becoming corporatized. So what's important is you bring in a grant. It doesn't matter whether you need a grant or you're not. You don't need a grant. Do your research. You need a grant to do the kind of research the grants sponsor, which means that certain questions get answered, and they tend to be questions that um, the, the granting agencies in the US 
our National Science Foundation, which is very positivist. So you, you tend to positivist methods and, and questions that positivist methods can answer. So it's like the method is, it's the tail wagging the dog, really. So the important questions, so there's, there's a lot of pressure and then there's issues of, somebody was saying in our conference about, oh, I don't say, I can't remember now we've been in a conference, but the closure of university. Um, universities in the United States, most of them, I mean, some state run universities, are private institutions. They're, they're corporations competing with other corporations. And so there's this emphasis on money generation. Uh, so I, I'm not going to say too much more. Um, I think that there's a pressure on sociology and all the social sciences to conform to this, these pressures, these market pressures or neoliberal pressures, because they have neoliberal inflation at the university. Or, or well, my friend wrote a book called College for Sale. I mean, it's, the, it, it's that kind of um, process. It's resisted, and we need to resist it, but it's hard to resist it. It's hard for younger people to resist it. Believe me, it's hard for younger people to resist it. And that, I guess I don't even say that in the end. If you're thinking about a future in sociology, which means you want to get a tenure track position, well, first of all, you, you have to be prepared to publish a parish. Um, and I think you can't be, you're going to have to accommodate to a certain extent and pick your battles and try to give the system what it, what it requires. And at the same time, carve out a place where you can do research that really matters to you. And you're gonna to have to live in that kind of shadow uh, where you're, 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 I think you can't be pure. I, I, I'm a good Catholic, you know, like we live in a fallen world and the world is fallen and the universities are fallen and don't expect absolute purity. Expect to, live, to, to be as virtuous as you can in a fallen world, it's out there. The university have fallen. <laughs> the university have fallen, as they were saying. Um, I, I think uh, from from Grant from uh, from um, expanded really the, the examination of sociology uh, to to link this to the broader ideological, political, and economic movements or forces that are in play. It's not just a different uh, matter, uh, but uh, probably Doctor Neil uh, may have. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, the main reason I think why we have this conversation and jumping off from where Grant left really is because we have commonalities among us regarding the development of sociology. And um, many Filipino sociologists, some are actually here, no, much recently wrote about the development of sociology in the Philippines. My colleague Leslie Advinville Lopez, in particular, uh, published a paper on it quite recently. And I think the relevance and strength of sociology as a discipline, despite its inadequacies or perceived inadequacies, is that it is tied, it really mirrors the very context upon which it has flourished and taken root. In the case of the Philippines, it has undergone several transformations, theoretically and methodologically. And we're no different from your experience because we, you know, Philippine sociology started out as a mirror image of American sociology. Empir empirical, there is intense emphasis on empiricism and positivism which has its strong point. But through the years, we find out it has its weaknesses. It has its demerits. And so I think we can relate intimately to what um, Professor Almudi mentioned, hybridization and the necessity and urgency of it. 
Admittedly, there are many of us in the Philippines who still think that sociology should be this way, right? And I don't blame them because many of us have been trained to think in compartments. And I think that's the American way of thinking about disciplines, compartmentalized, neat, you know, uh, clean boxes, which will distinguish sociology from political science, from psychology, from development studies, and whatnot. Right. But in reality, the social problems that we confront as social scientists are not compartmental. They're intersecting. And I think this is where the power you know, and the allure, if I may, interdisciplinary comes into play. Because in order for us to genuinely grasp the essence of a social problem, Sociology has to innovate in such a way that it embraces the prospect of complementing other social science and vice versa. So I think if I were to borrow feminist concept, intersectionality, I think is the way to go, which basically highlights you know, uh, the power and you know the importance interdisciplinarity. Nowadays, we say transdisciplinarity is more inclusive. Non-academics can even join in the conversation because they're practitioners. And I think on the ground, you know, solving social problems, really, we do not only rely on what, you know, academics have in store for us, but we rely more important on the engagements and the conversation that academics, along with their partners and communities, for example, are able to generate and produce. And I think as far as the prospect of sociology is concerned moving forward, I think it's that. It's that continuing engagement, engaging the press as part of the title of this conversation. Uh, basically, would like to shed light. Engaging the present would mean um, leaving or shall we say exercising radical humility as sociologists to admit that we don't know all the answers and so part of that would mean working in tandem or working together with other social scientists in examining the more important in solving difficult problems of the day. so i'll stop there in the meantime i'll turn it over to my colleague Jan is currently the president of the Philippines Sociology. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nia. I will also take the same line. Uh, sociology is a part of society and it grows uh, along with the historical development of the society. And then you were saying you know, exactly how, how the Philippine sociology was shaped by uh, colonial uh, powers. No? Uh, and, and you have, you have the sociology, we have the pathology. Um, and up until now, we are still, I think, even if you see the works, you know, how Philippines are struggling with different shades of um, their sociology, their identities, that of the West or the North, um, and finding, you know, finding our knowledge where, where, we, where we can find, where we can root our knowledge from, you know, our knowledge that is distinct from the North. You know? um, uh, we were also thinking about the present now. So we, we've seen how sociology developed. So we, are, we want to reflect where we are now and where society, uh, sociology might be in the future. Um, so, so now in the past few years, we've been, been so uh, we've, we've been so changed by the pandemic, you know, and uh, we were so confronted by the fourth industrial revolution. So these are big. Uh, forces that are shaping our world. Um, so we begin. So we I think we need to. In the in the past, we we see how to see all the sociological questions where all the world, these were focusing on social order. So what are the questions? I think we need to even here, for example, for the Philippines, for, for original sociologists, we need to to think about the new questions that need to be addressed. Uh, and then the challenges of sociology, challenges such as 
um, the, the need of the society now in relation to the fourth uh, industrial revolution, such as um, the, the scale needed by the young people, which is about being generalists. How are we going to, 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 to respond to that idea? No? Um, uh, where would sociology uh, be? So I understand now that you, you were, uh, were thinking that it's going to be interdisciplinary and perhaps transdisciplinary. Um, and then we will be thinking more about problems, no? um, problem based, area based uh, courses. So there are a lot of courses that are competing with traditional or disciplinary courses now. Um, so I think we, we also need to, to, to think into the future how sociology will provide with its new needs of, 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 of the countries, of the new needs of the universities. Universities are offering new courses, you know, courses that, that, that respond to the needs of the industry, for example. So, um, yeah, and, and, and of course, uh, that, that's for, for, for the students and for the program of sociology. Um, students need to find um, uh, identification you know, between their experience and sociology. And oftentimes, um, our students still feel alienated with a uh, sociological theory, with a the history of sociological thought, which is so, you know, focused on, yes, <laughs> in Europe. Uh, okay, so we, we, need, we need to think about that. Uh, about, about that thing, so for, for our students, for our faculty, we also need uh, research and publication. So there are a lot of challenges. You're mentioning how uh, the, the requirements of the publications are, are such that these are highly wide, um, focus on US scholars and the use of references, for example, if your, your paper is likely to be accepted in high care journals when you use um, this, uh, the, 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 the usual well uh, cited journal uh, offers today. So uh, the, the Filipinos or the, the um, sociologists from the third or, or the global south are having a hard time um, Finding themselves competing, you know, uh, using for, for Bordeaux, for example, you have accumulating social capital in order for them to, to, to survive and to compete. So, so there are a lot of, I will stop there. <laughs> yes, I <laughs> think emotional conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Um, conversation that we have with Siga, we're in the same mess. We're in the same, uh, the same yeah. Mess. yeah, yeah, let me just say, and carry on. So, the American sociologists essentially read three or four journals, the top journals. They don't publish in those journals, they don't read here. And to get into those journals, you've got to fit what they, what they say. So, it, it's, it's a very complex problem. Yeah. That, that's true. And uh, I think we, we, uh, we started about the, the pointing the problems. We're seeing that we're, there's similarity uh, that we have. And I think Dr. Lewis and uh, Dr. Hernando has opened possible points uh, way ahead. Um, I wonder if you have a rejoinder of, of, uh, from, from, from the panelists of the pathways at home, probably. And then um, we see one of you give some time our, to, to also open the conversation. Uh, the, the, the audience and then the, uh, the, the Zoom uh, links. But rejoinder from uh, the members of the panel? Um, I just wanted to say that I think from my perspective um, and from the conversations that I have come to with students, it's about, I think it's about how we articulate what animates or what motivates whatever it is we call it, call it sociology, whether we call it hybridity, whether we call it campus coming over. But that, and this, this is just a very personal perspective and it won't appeal to everybody, 
But if what we teach is in the fervor of navigating the world, identifying its problems, finding pathways to solution to different potential futures, there are so many crises and so many of them have been made by, you know, our generations and earlier and they're going to need, I mean, as much as we try to do things at the end of the day, it's the generation who are typically now the undergraduate students who are already trying to face some of those and that if we can talk about what you learn with us is techniques, tools, approaches that will aid in those struggles, in meeting those crises, in doing the, doing the knowledge creation that's required, doing the political work that's required, during, doing the advocacy that's required, doing the innovation that's required, that that can incorporate both theology and other disciplines, but that ultimately it's motivated by we can give you some real tools. They're tools, I think they should be tools that are also embedded in conceptual ideas because of the power of concepts and of theories to show up what futures can be and the way to get to futures. But, but the, I think there's something about how we talk about what, what the experience gives that's not about the subject matter, that is about what impact having that knowledge, those capabilities, that way of thinking can offer the student, the generation of students in what is going to be, you know, continue to be a challenging world to live in. Okay, I can see Professor Alanadi waving yeah. <laughs> to make a point. Two things. Um, if you might have the man of ideas and medium for more than a month, they also try to act. And uh, I was thinking what sort of concrete or helpful avenues can I open concretely, not only in terms of mentioning the presentation. But, so this morning, I sent an email to the Independent Foundation. It's a foundation that distributes every year 1 million euros in grants for interdisciplinary to home. And I told them in speaking with PSF, if you receive a project from the Philippines, what is possible? So their response was that the uh, ISRF is open to people of to people who are based in all universities. However, the project has to be hosted in the European universities. So this is mainly for legal reasons. But I want to mention that please, especially the younger researchers, especially there are projects basically to go to the bio. So it would be for people who are at first up. Uh, there are also grants for the first book, and there are also grants for people who are with career, senior their career, and it works on the buyout basis, which offers you an opportunity for five months during which you can really dedicate to research. And normally the European University, but there is for the European University, but it allows them to have a research and for free, we will put the name of their university. So ISRF, you can Google it. The second outlet that I want to mention, you know, I don't want to remain at the level of the year, it's the journal organization. This is a journal which is making efforts. If you look at, for example, just have a look at the editorial reports and have a look at the board of reviewers and see maybe if this can inspire you. But there is a little caveat because it's called organization. You will need to create some connection with either organization or that is the middle level, the middle sociological level, or at least with practices of organizing. As an associate editor there, I'm ready to I'm ready to consider serious paper that talks about organizing. And that would not be talking about formal organization. This is also a journal that would accept if you make the case for it. 
the family, for example, are organizations that, uh, that violent gangs are informal organizations, or quasi organizations. There are ways, basically, of bringing them to target. One of the advantages is that this is a journal that is aware of the problem of whiteness or of dominance, and better of post colonial, of the post colonial, I guess, is still waiting. So please just have a look at the journal, have a look at maybe uh, the editorial board and see if some of it can hire you. I think others are now taking notes. Um, uh, anyone? Grants? I'll be quick. I think I'm um, going to summarize what my colleagues said. But I think the situation that we're in, I'd say we, I speak with the I think as a sociologist with, with you. I think that the, what confronts us or what we could be using in the situation we're in is the best sociology that we have. And we use sociology to understand where we are. Now, the way that how I think of sociology is as follows there's probably two uh, four aspects to sociology very quickly. There's sociology as a body of knowledge. That's contested. I have to look at that. That's a sign of something wrong. So there's sociology of what knowledge is. There's sociology as an institution. Now, if we're going to survive in higher education, we need institutional life. So the institutional aspect is important as well. Now, then the kind of structural knowledge kind of thing. The last two are more to do with the reasons why people would become sociologists. One is sociology as a profession, where that's a career, uh, a, a regular job. It becomes sociology for itself. The other is sociology as a vocation, which is a commitment to value beyond the, if you like, the profession. So I can see there's tension between sociology as a vocation the sociology of the profession. I think everyone here understands what I'm talking about. And that perfectly understand. And now, now we have we have a we have a pick on, on how to think about the Philippine sociological roadmap this whole area. Uh, but as I've said, uh, this conversation is going to be the panel. Uh, we're expanding the conversation uh, to uh, the audience here in the room and also the audience in Zoom. Um, anyone from the audience who would want to open their thoughts or even ask questions from the panel or for the group? Yeah, yes, please. Um, just probably identify yourself. It's my microphone. Uh, hello, Paul. Uh, I'm John from the University. Um, I'm just wondering because um, I really agree that. Um, Interdisciplinarity is important, and that's where we be in the discipline. Um, I just want to ask, what's the value of maintaining um, um, the name of sociology? Yeah. Uh, I say, um, I'm reminded of I'm reminded of what um, sociological imagination. Um, see you right now. In the 1950s, about um, about what Siri said about about um um maintaining discipline and interdisciplinarity, and then I also I was also reminded of what um Jonathan Turner um wrote in 2001 um his handbook in sociology. Um, he mentioned that in, in the introductory chapter, he mentioned that um, the problem with the discipline is that we have too many theories, we have too many methodologies, we have too many internal debates, and it seems that um, those things don't communicate. And um, that kind of um, uh, theoretical and methodological diversity, although um, it's a strength of the discipline, it also um, diminishes our identity, unlike economics, for example, or political science. And then we're here um, looking to interdisciplinarity and promoting the 
hybrid relationship in the northern South sociology. So I was what I'm wondering what's the value of keeping the name of sociology? Um, is there any leverage that we have if we will um if we will um maintain the identity of sociology as sociology compared to other I, I think it's Janice throwing that out and also inviting you to comment. Any thoughts? Yes, uh, Professor Alumni. Yeah, limited resources. <laughs> um, I get your point, and that was the question that was brought to pay in, uh, in Cambridge in the early 2000s when Tony Lawson was writing his variant economy. Although for Tony Lawson, it was the opposite problem. He was advocating a highly interdisciplinary approach to economics that would break with the mathematization. And then we were left as a group. I think, okay, so why should we call this economics rather than social science in general? Or perhaps even better, social studies. In truth, I think for my work, when I look at it, I think that social studies is the better way. That being said, that being said, in whatever social studies, Interdisciplinary structure. There will be aspects that will foreground and aspects that will lead in the background. I cannot imagine a decent social study that does not take into account psychological aspects, sociological aspects, and moral aspects, and perhaps even economic aspects. However, the question is what will you foreground? Now, one possible definition of sociology we take for it, right? It is that it is about the study of relations between social positions, relations between social roles, and the relations between these relations. So now I'm tempted to say it really very much depends what we put forward. If what we're putting forward is, for example, the measuring relation. If what we're putting forward is the network of relations, the relations between relations. Again, it doesn't mean that we forget the rest. It just means that in the way we write the paper, we will get more rounded. Then perhaps that could be one way of maintaining sociology while acknowledging the interdisciplinarity of the development of the Any points? Yeah, um, well, so your question is really provocative to me because I'm no longer part of the institution of sociology. <laughs> I'm a part of the communications. I publish in, I publish in communication and philosophy. I'm part of different program. But I think that there is value in the, I, Grant. I really like this fourfold notion that Grant uh, proposed. And I think there's something important about the institution of sociology. There's a conversation that began. The sociology represents a conversation with all this, but all research traditions are, are continuing conversations. That's what makes researchers research. That's what makes researchers scholars and not just researchers, is that you fit into a conversation. And I think that that conversation, the sociology um, began and, and continues, is an important one. Um, so I, I think that the job is to protect it and to challenge the institution of it. Um, and, and I, I see value in it and I still identify it. Uh, uh, yeah, yes, uh, uh, yeah, Catherine. Um, I, I think, Doug, like you, like my reaction, maybe for different reasons, but I feel very protective of sociology as an institution, as a discipline, even though I can consider myself to do interdisciplinary work and aim for a transdisciplinary response to a social problem. And I think it's about uh, the lens through which I look at the world intuitively or the way I've been cultured to think of the world. When I started reading sociology, it more connected for me. I have a, a bit of a, uh, I can say textured history, 
but I have studied some economics and I've studied some political economy, I've studied some I've studied some law and I'm actually employed and not, not to any level of completion or you know, anything, but in trying to find who I was and what what enabled me to do the kind of work I was interested in doing. And sociology for me was where I found that. But I work in a law school and I'm even more aware in that context of just how different my lens on the world is to how people who have been trained through the law school and the way that the law is taught, the way that they see the world. And they only see the individual. Everything is through the lens of what does the individual do, what does the individual think, what is the individual, it's all individual. And trying to have conversations about social structures of different kinds and social relations of different kinds is, is difficult because it's not part of their training. And I think that is, to me, something that defines sociology is that ongoing interest in trying to understand structures in relation to human agency as part of the way that we understand the structures of the world. Okay. Yes. For me, it's easy to answer the question. Could sociology remain sociology? I see myself clearly in the view of sociology as a location. And I find myself falling in and out of class. Um, I operate at the borderlands of sociology, sometimes in. Sometimes out. Because Marxism has always been a mark. Um, what's the word? Discipline itself, I suppose, in sociology. So I'm kind of used to that. So, on the one hand, I say sociology disappears, doesn't matter, I'll go somewhere else. <laughs> because I've got commitments. But on the other hand, I say there's some really important things in terms of, in terms of what it can do and say that other approaches can't. So I fall in, I fall out. Um, quite comfortable with where I am. <laughs> yes, uh, Dr. Yvisenia. I think there is value in maintaining that lexicon of sociology uh, in terms of you know, the politics of preference having that brand, having that name, you know, helps a lot. Um, I can think of an example, well-being or wellness, and it's a controversial topic. It's an important topic nowadays for various valid reasons. And more often than not, whenever we frame this, I mean, wellness, it's oftentimes framed you know, individually, the perspective is individual. And that's important right, to focus and to care for the individual. But I think the value that sociology can contribute to problematizing wellness is the structure of it. Because if we're merely putting too much pressure on the individual to be better, if we're putting the onus or the responsibility on individuals, to bounce back. I think that is an incomplete appreciation of what an individual's role in society or his or her position in society is. And so the only he's contributing really is to uncover the structural problems that push individuals to the brink of emotional breakdown. And to be able to appreciate wellness in its entirety, I think sociology's value is something like it. It's just that we've grown accustomed to looking at wellness from an individual perspective, which in itself is important, but incomplete. And so I think from that example alone, John, we can already take note and embrace the merits of sociology as sociology. The, the power of sociology to respond. Um, we're, we're down to the last 12 minutes, and I was just told that there's a comment from uh, the Zoom. Maybe we can ask um, Denise, one of our 
technical uh, helper to, to, to help us read the call. Hey, uh, hello everyone. So the question is from Jason Bahar from Savior Ateneo. So the question is, during these times where many people claim to be experts of the study of society, politics, etc., how should we protect the integrity of our respective experience, social science, and make ourselves more relevant to the public? Do you think that the academe is lacking effort in terms of institutionalized social science? Um, and it was for the panel, but we can also ask this to offer some response. But we can start from the panel. Remember, we're down to 10 minutes. I think that um, positivism was the attempt of the social sciences to uh, make themselves look like the natural sciences and um, procure their esteem. And political science has caved into that almost completely. Economics even more so. Psychology to a great extent. Um, no, I think that sociology should resist that. Um, and yes, uh, it's my own, it's my own one. There is one activity sociology can immerse which is about me first. I mean, up until the 18th century, people were still believing like a, that women had fewer teeth than men. And no one went to verify. But my point is that today, if you read the Then the portrait, the, the, the portrait award that they created for imagination. That is very disconnected from reality, where you would know, that it's filled with moral panic for teenagers giving birth in those horrible conditions, uh, foreigners being violent, the Muslims being violent, uh, and so on and so forth. And left team really wanted you to become in this case. Now, I believe that as sociologists, what we can do, and it's not a matter of being a positivist, it is just a matter of being truthful and of bringing. But we, I'm not saying that the storms are very powerful, maybe they can overwhelm us, but at least we can remain as a rock and continue to speak with journalists. The journalists don't want to interview me, and at least it's try to be as truthful as I can on the basis of all the hours they spend reading a lot of society in which I live. Because common people do not have the luxury of reading, reading about the society in which they live. And the butcher had to spend time getting me. So they won't have the time to get informed. But at least as a sociologist, I think what we can do is back with me. Um, uh, we're, we're really down to the, to the wall, but uh, the, the discussion is heating up. Uh, we, we can probably collect uh, the, the points, we, we collect them, and then uh, we'll have one big response. Uh, we, we can start from, from, from the audience, there's supposed to one from the team. But from the audience, I think there are two uh, two topics. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the great discussion. Um, I'm Victor, coming from um, 3AB Interdisciplinary Study. And right now, outside the university, I'm also engaging in a project related to mental wellness. Basically, it's uh, the mission is really having mental health and well-being. And right now I'm in the research and design process. And based from my previous consultations, most of their um, responses are coming. They said that most of my, um, most of the knowledge and research that I am focusing on are coming from the West. And maybe because of my personality and also at the same time because of the education or how I thought. So my question is, uh, We've talked about the what, maybe the sense made about the how, in terms of how do we balance hybridization of um, research coming from the global support and global south, and how can we choose the right research based on the context? Let's say in the Philippine context, mostly, uh, let's say in my research, well, mostly coming from global more, do I need to really find more research? more consultations coming from Global South 
or should I just really find the right research that will apply? So, 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 Hi, thanks for the opportunity to learn from you. Uh, my name is Danica, and I didn't want to say this, but I am from the business sector. So somebody said dark sociology, felt embarrassed first, but you know what? I'm not, I kind of agree with you. So, <laughs> so um, yeah, I've been running a career and life coaching company for the last few years. I have gathered observations about human behavior and experience that I think would be important in whatever you're doing right now. And I don't really have a question, rather just observation. I believe will serve the seed to whatever research you have right now. So there was a discussion about the need for interdisciplinarity. I actually agree with that. I actually graduated from Ateneo interdisciplinary study. So of course I would be biased to that. I agree with that because there was a discussion earlier that said um, that we are so obsessed about compartmentalizing things, not really knowing that these things are interconnected and that we are essentially saying the same thing, that we are just using a different language, a different point of view to discuss this. But what happened to our society that we think that these things are actually essentially different when they're actually the same? This is the reason why we always fight, because we think that we're saying different things. But actually, we are saying the exact same thing from just different perspectives. And I I note here that there was a discussion post colonization something related to education. We have this mindset that we believe that we should just feed information to people, not thinking that maybe they already know something and that we should be teaching them how to ask questions and actively listen so that they can articulate this into knowledge that we don't know just yet. And uh, on the topic of dark sociology, I actually personally rant about that to myself. Um, for example, I, I coach people how to film. And one of the things that I observe when they're doing that is they're empirical about it. And I almost told one of them, why are you treating these people like they're people under a microscope? Why are we not engaging with them like they're people? Selling is supposed to be helping, not making money out of people and thinking that this is the science, right? We are social beings. We know how to sell. We sell when we talk about things that are passionate to us, but how can we can do that in the context of sales? How can we turn that into something scientific and methodological? And there is this discussion also on, um, in American sociology and theorism. I'm not interested in conceptual thinking. The Philippines is, in, is um, influenced by Western thinking a lot. And um, what I observe in modern thinking right now here in the country is that people are leaning towards empiricism and won't believe anything if it doesn't have empirical evidence. But just because something doesn't have empirical evidence doesn't mean it's not real. And another thing also is commodity, commodification of education. We, it connects to that part about how there are only a few people who enter sociology. So if we perceive going into degree programs as a competition where we are telling students to go here and here, then I think that this would put sociology at risk. I think you should acknowledge that this is all interconnected. And if a student is to choose which bachelor's degree they have to go to, it has to be the bachelor's degree that resonates with them the most. It is the foundational discipline that they have. And if they want to explore everything else, then that is after they achieve this bachelor's degree. Those are my observations. I hope they serve as you to whatever research you have. Thank you. Very quick, Mary, if you have some. Okay. Um, we quickly, very quickly. Uh, so sorry about this, but I just, like, the idea just popped in moments after everybody shared everything. Hi, I'm Danny, I'm from Merrim College, and I had the pleasure to actually listen to Dr. Leland's talk in Tumageddon City, where they talked about the sociology of well-being, and it really had me thinking, because I'm coming from a psychology background, I work in the guidance and counseling office of Merrim College, and I love how this discussion is really uh, coming close to what I wanted to know about here. And that is how can we really 
you know, start the conversation on wellness and turn it into a more collective pursuit. Because the more I work in psychology, the more I delve into mental wellness from my own background, that is psychology, the more I feel upset and how individualized it is, you know, therapy. And there's this whole new phenomenon online that we really see as therapy speak, where people weaponize the things that they've learned in therapy and they they value, you know, individual wellness over collective well-being, that they fail to realize that wellness is actually this big environmental issue that we have to look into. So I really wanted to know. I feel like this is also just adding to the conversation on, you know, really the importance of the label of psychology. I think as somebody with a psych background, I can look into your discipline and ask what can we possibly do to make wellness something that's more of a collective issue than it is an individual. Thank you. We have a crisis of time, sorry. We have a crisis of time. Um, it's already uh, celebrated. I, I, uh, I, I was told that the uh, Zoom is actually smoking pot. I'm conscious. <laughs> I'm not really so sure if we're going to pick up what. But would you want some response or we'll, we'll probably send the questions to you? Yeah, what is what? We, we don't have much time. <laughs> Okay, okay. Uh, uh, there's there's a can we just collect one question from Zoom? Uh, I was told that there's one question with so many likes. <laughs> okay, so um for the people in the Zoom, uh, we apologize for no longer entertaining questions, but we will uh we will entertain one question that we just asked. So, this is a question from Mai. The question is I believe psychologists should have more conversations with corporations, much like how economists or political analysts do briefings in corporations. Given that we cannot rely on the government to do much for our countrymen, the private sector is trying to step up and do their part in uplifting the lives of people. As such, it is important that as corporations try to do their part, they be guided and grounded in reality so that they, they, they can think of innovations that would help solve human problems. Sociology coupled with strategic foresight and or future speaking is powerful in corporations. Okay, um, we'll, we'll, we'll just get the response from whoever would want to respond to the panel. Um, after this, we'll just end the conversation formally. So uh, you, can, you can approach the panelists. So we'll start from uh, Ismail and then Congrats. And whoever okay, okay, okay. but for someone who worked in management, who worked in my for over 20 years, uh, I'm in a permanent executive conversation with corporations. Um, what I can tell it is that whenever I speak, for example, with executive managers, so people who are at high levels or senior managers who are, or who are already at student. We see how little power corporations have. In a specific sense, corporations have huge power. They have more power than governments, one hand. But on the other hand, these MBAs, in specific, their powers are very limited. They don't want to do their job, firstly. Secondly, very often they need compulsory regulation. Why? Because the first person who behaves is kicked out of the market. They are creating a competitive disadvantage for their own corporation. As long as they are competing with people who are allowed to go to as well. So, this is to hint at the limits, the dire limits of corporations. Corporate executives are a threat for their jobs, they don't have tenure. And corporations are very limited because of competition, which means that we are creating a competitive disadvantage. They should try to act morally. Of course, there are new and good family corporations can afford the two years of losses, so they did not afford the market. But this is a point for you to highlight the limits of corporations and the importance of, of compulsory regulation. Democratically, uh, Grant, I'd like to respond to the last question, but also particularly the question about business. I, I love the provocation. Um, it reminds me of my daughter, who's a missing woman. And we have wonderful conversations 
But the thing is, um, my daughter is the most wonderful human being. She is authentic and she is true. And she's a businesswoman. Now, I think that that's the key is authenticity. I mean, markets existed before capitalism. All right. Now, here's an example of authenticity that I read recently from that famous person called Anonymous. And it went like this. I've always loved the way she smiled. When I met her, she taught me how. So there it is. There's the, the smile, is the honesty, but it was fake. Now, capitalism for me is fake. It cannot, in the end, supply the goods for, and, and the needs for life for humanity. It can do it for a few. It is in authenticity. Do I think a business person can be authentic? And I think that's uh, the, the, the word. But not just the final word. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to put the, put the notice, but um, we will continue the conversation probably right after the audience can approach. And uh, and we, we, we will actually, we have actually tied this up on YouTube. Uh, and of course, you can always comment on YouTube so we can carry on the conversation on, on, on YouTube with invitation. Uh, so we'll, we'll share. Uh, the, the link to the usual you can find it. Uh, but but for the for the for the final word, uh, we invited the, the dean of the school of social science, my boss, to to offer us the, the, the final word. Uh, she's a sociologist. She finished sociology at uh, Erfurt uh, University in, in, in Germany. She's currently in. Uh, please uh, welcome. Help me welcome Professor Charina Salama. Okay, I have the most difficult task to formally close this conversation. But um, this is like coming home for me. Uh, this is my department hosting this conversation, my home since 1996. And I was president of the Indian Social Watch Society over 20 years ago. So this is really coming home. I reckon I can relate to Dog's observation about theory and method when I was. Deciding on where to do my PhD, I read an article. I was not yet in the business of citation, but I heard that was a magazine. Um, that if I want methodological advancement, I go to the US. I want to development, I go to Europe. I chose Germany. I could go a pilgrimage to Fear, birthplace of Marx. So, our distinguished interlocutors. Uh, Professor Douglas Corpora, Professor Moody, uh, Professor Mary John Renato, uh, Dr. Grant Banfield, Dr. Gatrin Hastings, and Dr. Nino Lutiste, sociologists and non sociologists on site in Ateneo de Manila and online. Uh, okay, good evening. On behalf of the School of Social Sciences, the larger school of the nine schools in Ateneo de Manila University, in terms of student population, faculty, degree programs, research centers. I thank you for choosing to spend your Tuesday evening until around 7.40 tonight. We collectively looked at the future and sociology as an object of investigation. Your time would have asked us, and I think we did, to look at the future of sociology as a social path the social structures and cultural norms and values that are external to and coercive of actors. So market, capitalism, even parents. <laughs> so Weber might say the future of sociology has both structural, intellectual components. The meanings that we attach and reference science publication, which bore away, um, um, Current contemporary sociologists develop sociology as a vocation. It's a very inspiring concept. And then there is, of course, Marx, our identity politics, systemic privilege of colonial relationships, 
And Emmanuel Wallerstein talked about opening up the social sciences to other fields and disciplines. And I think it's about transdisciplinarity, hybridity. Um, you just have to open up the social sciences, transdisciplinarity. So I am sure we are and should still be asking a lot of questions. To raise a question is to make a point. This is just a start. So my thanks to Dr. Jose Joao Rudai, Chair of the Department of Anthropology, my colleagues, Mary Raul Nino, here, everyone here, Milan, Leslie, um, for hosting us today at the Sociological Society and the International Association for um, Critical Realism for making this conversation possible. Let me end by telling a story about Dr. Jose Rizal, our national hero, an Athenian. And Farid Alatas tells us that he is also a sociologist doing sociological theory, so social thinker, especially in the book Sociological Theory Beyond the Town. So, our hero on the way to his execution 126 years ago, he's, he's said to have caught a glimpse of Ateneo Municipal de Manila, old name of Ateneo, uh, and asked, Is that the Ateneo? I spent many happy years. So to our guests here who are on the, here on the occasion of the International Association for Critical Realism Conference, guests from outside of Ateneo, may you, like Dr. Jose Rizal, spend many happy days in the Ateneo. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That, um, the, the conversation, but the conversation can carry on. Uh, just to to uh, to emphasize that we can carry on the conversation as well online on on YouTube. We just type in the title "Engaging the Protagonist" on the on the YouTube search bar. You can you can you can find like find this and um, offer some comments. And we are trying to to, to chat and also uh, respond if you can now for the panel. So we're ending this conversation, at least for the time being, and of course, let the conversation begin. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you. 